In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. It seemed like executives uh, got excited about an idea and, and pushed it on to the rest of the company. And people didn't quite feel like they could ask hard questions about it. And they executed uh, the project. It didn't work out. And then uh, a new CEO came in. There was some executive changeover. So in theory, a new culture, but everyone was still really afraid. All the projects that were being worked on were these tiny optimizations, uh, none of which were going to help the company achieve these bigger goals it was setting out for itself. So everyone was working on things that had a high likelihood of success and a low likelihood of actually achieving great impact. Um, and that was kind of the lesson that they'd been learning. And there was, there was a lot that had to be done to shake that up, um, both directly talking to it and speaking with it, but also rethinking, being really clear about the goals and the metrics, and then creating a roadmap, uh, a high-level roadmap, not one that dictated features, but one that sort of laid out these initiatives for these big goals that we had to do, and allowing people to realize, okay, like we have to connect to these big goals. That means our results have to be bigger, but you can't get bigger results without more risk. That's that's the deal. That's the dance with the devil, right? If you want, it's, you, you see this in investment banking, and you see this in, in entrepreneurship, you see it in stock trading, right? If you want more upside, you got to take more risk. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers. And together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hey, it's Aga. Welcome to episode 71 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Culture Strategy Bootcamp a virtual bootcamp that helps leaders create a thriving culture at scale. If you are a leader in a company that grows, and if you want to start turning a culture into a genuine accelerant of meaningful growth, the bootcamp is definitely something to check out. The first edition of the bootcamp is already underway, but if you'd like to join the next cohort, sign up for updates by typing this into your browser bit.ly forward slash culture dash bootcamp. That's bit.ly forward slash culture dash bootcamp. Okay, so let me introduce you to my guest today, Gif Constable. Gif has started and sold a few companies. He ran a global innovation consulting company called Neo, and then he went back in-house and ran product at a few companies. Most recently, he was the chief product officer at Meetup. He wrote two books on designing products that customers love, and he's also an author of science fiction books and an all-round tremendous human being. In this wide-ranging conversation, we cover a lot of ground. We talk about developing great products, leadership, designing an HR function that actually works for the business, creating psychological safety, taking on creating per creative pursuits that scare us, and much, much more. So, Without further ado, here is Gif Constable. Gif, welcome to the Culture Lab. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to have you. I'm very excited about this conversation. You've been recommended um, by Tommy Forstrom, and he's such a great guy. I really enjoyed speaking to him. And he didn't have to think for a second. The moment I asked him, who would you recommend? The great guest on the podcast. He was like, definitely GIF. You have to speak to GIF. So here you are. And I'm sure that it's going to be a fun conversation. Um, 
first, I want to ask you the obvious question, which is, um, who are you? And, you know, what, what do you do? Could you do a quick intro? Well, I've spent a little over 25 years in technology wearing various hats. I've started and sold a few companies. Um, I ran a global uh, consult innovation consulting company called Neo that Pivotal bought. Um, and then I went back in-house and ran product at a few marketplaces. Most recently was the chief product officer at Meetup. Um, but you know, I've, I've been in and around uh, the technology industry for a very long time, first on the business side, then on the product side. And I'm also an author. I've, I've written a few books, both on entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, as well as some science fiction for fun. Yeah, that's amazing. So you are a product leader, an entrepreneur, and an author. Which of these three identities do you identify most with? That's impossible to answer. <laughs> the, the, well, you know, it's it's funny. Uh, I was talking to a friend the other day, and he called himself a chimera. And the, the there's a, a lot of pressure in the world to make you pick a lane and stick to a lane. And honestly, that's often the smarter way to be for your career. Um, I've often looked back at my career and joked that I'm unhirable to a certain extent uh, <laughs> because I've been interested in so many things and I've, I've allowed myself, for lack of a better phrase, to chase those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I am all of those things. And what's interesting is that the, the older I get uh, and the more senior I get, the more useful all of those experiences become. Totally. I couldn't agree more. I think, um, as Steve Jobs said, you can really connect these dots only when you look back. And sometimes it doesn't make sense um, when you are um, starting doing something because it's just so out there. But 10 years down the line, it makes total sense. And you just get how much it has given you. Um, in what, what you are doing right now uh, professionally. So I totally get that. Even yeah. in my case, um, I've never realized that um, dancing tango or rather learning to dance tango would have such a huge impact on how I interview people on how I work with my clients, you know, and, and, and generally even how I think about life. So here you go. Um, as crazy as it might sound, I totally resonate with what you have just said. I uh, love so, that. I've never heard that. Tango. Okay, you, you may have to explain to me, how does tango yeah. help you interview people? Now I need to know. So tango, Argentinian tango, is not choreographed at all. Um, and basically um, what happens when you dance, you dance in a very tight embrace. And obviously it's very intimate. Um, but you don't know where your partner is going to lead you. Usually as a female, you follow. And so um, the guy will lead and you will follow. But actually, it's an act of co-creation. So you listen to the music. Um, you, you listen to the basically the solar plexus of your partner because that's the point of connection. And those are really microscopic movements that tell you how your legs need to move. And so it's really magical and, and the, the way of communication just without words, you know, and without choreography. So you really have to be super present in the moment. And I find obviously when you speak to someone, especially when you interview someone, when you can be that connected and when you can be that present, um, then it's really magical. So I find that it really helps to interview. I love that. <laughs> In some ways, you're describing how product teams need to work, or, and my mind also goes to customer research. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things I really try to teach people when they need to get out of their own head and talk to their customers is like really listening, like really being in that moment and listening and allow your curiosity to fuel all those follow on questions that you need to ask to get to why something's really happening. Totally. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, so you've spent a huge chunk of your life, um, doing that dance and putting new things into the world, like products and books and companies. Um, so I want to tap into your experience in this area for a moment. So let's talk about ideas. Um, 
the one thing that comes to my mind when I think about ideas and how we come up with something and get excited about it is what Anais Nin once said. And she said that we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are. And I think as a result, every new idea that um, comes to our mind and we get excited about, it comes wrapped in a set of assumptions and beliefs that is unique to us. And so my question to you, Gif, is how can we get out of our own head and see our ideas through um, a different, perhaps more accurate lens? That's a great phrase. The we're all struggling, and this isn't just for new ideas, this is actually for so much of life and work. We're all struggling with our own cognitive biases. And when it comes to, let's say, an entrepreneur thinking about, or, or it doesn't have to be just an entrepreneur, it could be anyone who's thinking about a new idea, someone who's thinking about um, changing something in the world, big or small, that wants to make a dent uh, in other people's lives. Our own belief systems and our own strengths and weaknesses uh, make a huge difference. And the a critical thing is, is trying to get self-aware about your own strengths and weaknesses so then you can get to balance. For me personally, I realized uh, about midway through my career that I would get very excited about ideas. I, I have always thought a lot about, you know, why does the world this work this way and shouldn't it work in a different way? And for better or for worse, and my mother thought I was a lunatic, but I was willing to jump in with both feet to try to affect those changes. I realized that I was um, jumping a little too fast, a little too enthusiastically, and that I needed to compliment myself by asking really hard questions about what I was working on. And that's what led me to reading Steve Blank's work, uh, which then really got popularized by Eric Ries with the Lean Startup and um, got to know them and became a really early adopter. And that was a very important uh, point for me to complement my own strengths and weaknesses with some sort of methodology or framework to, um, I needed to reality check myself a little bit more. Other people have a different problem, right? Some people, uh, or actually get too caught up in the reality checking and they need to push themselves a little bit more on the, the vision side or the risk-taking side. So there's not a one size fits all. And actually when people look at these different startup mythologies or methodologies, I mean, and they go, oh, MVP and lean startup is a great idea or it's a terrible idea. Actually, so much of those judgment calls is um, them taking a particular thing and saying, okay, that doesn't work for me. And that may be the case. Go mm -hmm. find out what works for you. But either way, you need to take a, you know, there needs to be balance in the force. And uh, you need to take a balanced approach to these things. You need to fight against your own cognitive biases. And that means you need to know what those are. Yeah, I love that. I think it's such an important point. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for, you know, shedding light on the other side of the coin. I guess I've been thinking about people getting overexcited about ideas, uh, something that happens more frequently, because the people that I spend a lot of time with are entrepreneurs and founders. And I think that the majority of founders I've met personally, um, are quite enthusiastic about their ideas. Yep. Um, and, and I think that it's safe to say that's probably the majority of people you have to be, you have to have a lot of passion. You have to have a lot of belief that, that, um, the idea that you have come up with is going to work to really put everything on the line and invest so much time, energy and money in, in something. So, um, Thanks for shedding light on the other side of the coin, which is some people feel um, are sort of getting stuck on the on the reality side of things. And I can also relate to that, especially working in organizations that are slightly more mature and bureaucratic. Um, then there's definitely the sense that reality is um, heavy and it keeps us anchored in a way. And so a lot of things are impossible. Do you see this as well? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, large companies really struggle. They do well with optimization. They have such momentum and they do well with that momentum. 
um, and it makes them hard to unseat uh, when you're trying to compete against them. But they really struggle to allow that risk taking and innovation. Um, they're different mindsets or different modes of, of behavior. And you can't take a one size fits all to them. At NEO, we worked with a lot of very large companies trying to help them test out new business models, come up with those and then test them out. Um, and, uh, and I walked away from that experience running that company, um, cynical, I'll be honest with you, uh, that, that most of these companies just weren't going to be able to do what it took to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. And so they were falling back on, okay, well, let's just go acquire businesses. Um, and, and and to a certain extent, it's like, yeah, until you're really ready to change and understand how these modes are different, then you're actually better off not trying and just acquiring. But it's a bit heartbreaking because you've got people and ideas and potential inside these companies that really could allow great things to happen. And so why are they having to go outside um, for mm. this innovation? They, they shouldn't have to, but, it, but we get in our own way so often. It's so interesting that that you share that because I um, I spent a lot of time working for large large consultancies like Corn Ferry and PwC, and obviously working with um, large corporates uh, for many many years. And so when I struck out on my own, I um, I took some of these clients with me, and with time I realized that actually. One of the reasons I felt this need to strike out on my own is to do work with slightly different organizations as well for exactly the same reasons. So my focus is on culture and I think a lot of really large organizations that, again, have a lot of incredibly talented people with a lot of passion, they struggle to find a way to commit to um, to the work and to bring about change. Um, so it's quite similar to innovation. I think it's, you know, when you have such a huge ship, um, it's really hard to turn it. And so I find it um, way more fulfilling to work with agile, more agile organizations, startups, scale-ups. It's um, quite exciting. Um, but I want to, I want to circle back to what you've um, mentioned before about getting out of your own head and doing a reality check. So you said that this was something that you felt like you needed to do. Yes. And um, one of your books is called Talking to Humans. Success starts with understanding your customers. Um, and you have alluded already that we need to test our ideas with other humans. Why is it so important? Well, you know, Anything that's going to make a dent in the world has to start with a vision, with excitement. We were just talking about this. But our own, we're only a market of one, right? Our, our own needs are not indicative of everyone else's needs. It's easy. Uh, our human nature sometimes allows us to think that way, but that's not actually truth. Um, and so we come to our ideas with these assumptions and these belief systems, some of which we're aware of, some of which we're not. But if you just stick to those, if you're not open to allowing the world to tell you how, how it actually wants this idea to manifest, how it needs this idea to manifest for you to have a sustainable and effective business, then your odds of success are going to be really low. And let me clarify something. I don't mean um, just saying to the world, tell me what to build. Actually, I think mm -hmm. that's a terrible way to build products. Yeah, it's a little bit like Henry Ford, right? Who said, yeah. if, if you ask people what they want, they will tell you, I want a faster horse. So this is not an idea. This is not the idea to tell people what they want or what you should create. So how? What sort of questions should you be asking and what sort of things should you be focusing on? Well, you're trying to understand people's goals and their needs. And so when I'm teaching teams to do what people call customer discovery, qualitative research, right? Get, get out of your head. Go, go listen to people. Go talk to people. The, the, best, the best sort of uh, way to approach it, uh, especially in the early days, is to look at people's behaviors, get them to tell you stories. Um, don't get people to predict the future. We're terrible at predicting the future and predicting <laughs> our own behavior. We're, 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 we're all god awful at it. 
But what you can say is, you know, here's the last time I tried to do this and here's how I tried to solve it. And I went and attempted to work with these two companies because I was so frustrated with the first, et cetera, et cetera. You get people starting to tell you stories about what they've done, what they've tried to do. And as they're explaining that, um, you could ask a lot of questions about why, how are you feeling? What was going on? What were you trying to accomplish? Um, If you can understand people's underlying goals. And it takes some doing to actually open people up and get to the the truth of their underlying goals. A lot of times we have these surface level beliefs um, about how we're how we think that are colored by how we're supposed to think. And so when you're talking to people about something they did, I know I'm talking in the abstract right now, uh, but but you will get people that will give you one answer and you have to go deeper. And to, to tie this back to your original question, it's your your job as as a product designer is to understand people's challenges, their goals, what they're seeking, and then you need to come up with so, the solution for those, right? And even if people tell you, "I want X, Y, and Z," again, your job is to say, "Well, why? What's behind that?" And maybe X, Y, or Z was a particularly good idea. Oftentimes it's not, right? Because you know people's ability to design products is uneven and some people are better at it than others. And so anyway, to, to, to wrap this up, you need to, you need to expose your ideas out to the world um, to learn and figure out what's actually going to work. And you need to interact with people in ways that really get to the root causes of their behavior, where they spend money, why they change, why they seek things out. And that will just increase the odds that you can um, have something that's successful. So much of what I have written about and and tried myself is just all about this question of, of how do you put something new in the world and have it actually work? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking about how many levels and layers there really are because obviously you have this level of creating a product that your customer is going to want and need and um or a service that um really meets uh, a need or or solve a, a real problem for for your customers and then there is also somehow fitting the narrative that people are telling themselves about who they are and what they need in life, right? So I think having these conversations are so important on both of these levels because they can definitely tell you a lot about what the needs are, what the problems are, what the frustrations are, where the money gets spent, et cetera, et cetera. But also even when you get this superficial answer Like, you know, I've been speaking to a lot lot of founders trying to figure out what people think about or rather what would they need around culture. And of course, you get a lot of answers that um, just are the right thing to say, right? And Mm -hmm. how people want to be perceived. But I think it's good as well. It's important as well because it gives you an insight into how this person wants the world to look at them. Yep. So I love your work and I love what you are doing um, around encouraging people to get out there and creating um, a practice. I think it is a practice, isn't it? Because it's definitely not a one and done kind of approach. You, you, I, I'm assuming that you need to have these conversations on an ongoing basis. Yeah, actually, that's where a lot of companies go wrong. Is at the beginning, the founders do it themselves. Um, hopefully they do it, uh, but they do it themselves. And then they get busy and things start to scale. And those interactions get pushed down to customer support. They get pushed out to the sales team. And and people get isolated from what's really happening in the market. And that's all good. You need to scale. But it's really worthwhile to keep a personal connection to what's happening around your business. I'm talking about product, but it's, it's both. It's your business and your product are totally intertwined um, all the time. And when product teams in particular get hidden behind a wall of customer support and sales teams, they really go off the rails. Um, It's not that you're not listening to what's happening from uh, inside sales and customer support. You're getting great insights from those teams, but you have to go out and do your own 
research. It's, I was just um, talking to a company recently and they were trying to figure out where do we put our customer insights team? Do we put it in marketing? Do we put it in product? Uh-huh. And I said, you put it everywhere. <laughs> not the place to optimize. You know, yeah. I, I know you're a decent sized company. You're looking for efficiencies. This is not the place to do mm-hmm. it. W- what you don't want is a battle of sort of the high moral ground of who mm-hmm. understands the customer better. Absolutely. You want everyone really understanding the customer and the business and then coming because they've each done their own work to be informed, coming with those different perspectives uh, together to then have the debates that are really useful and necessary to then come up with better answers. But if it's left in one particular silo or if people get blocked out from the customer when they have to make decisions that will affect the experience of the customer, it's a, it's a recipe for mediocrity. It's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. And I'm so glad to hear this from you because actually when, when I work with high growth um, startups um, or rather before I start, um, we do sort of a contracting session where we talk about what would it look like if we work together and what sort of things I would need from them um, to be able to produce the results that they want. And one of the things that I ask, and it always makes people look at each other like the team is looking you know at each other and thinking what is, is she serious um because one of the things that i say is that at least for the period we work together i'd like each um senior leadership um team member to have two conversations once per week one is with your end users or customers mm-hmm. and the other one is with your uh frontline employees yeah. every single week two people customer and frontline employee and ask them a few questions. One of them is what should we start doing? What should we stop doing? What should we keep doing? Because it's, it's going well. And initially people are like, are, are you crazy? We're so busy. There's no way we'll find a time. But of course, as you know very well yourself, it is really transformational because you learn stuff that you wouldn't know, especially at, at that level. And um, when you harvest this information and then try to make sense out of it, these are, I think, moments where you really have major breakthroughs. But a question to you as an expert in this area is, so we harvest data, it's through, you know, qualitative um data, like conversations with people and quantitative data. But how do you then really utilize that? And what is the, what is the best way to figure out the patterns and find the signal in the noise? Uh, because it can be quite overwhelming. I, I wonder if you have some advice um, to give to people. You know, I'm always looking for as many vectors into uh, an important decision as possible. Not to the point of analysis paralysis. Um, I actually think that your pace, the, the, the cycle, this is a little wonky, uh, I apologize in advance, but the cycle times of decision making uh, really affects your ability to succeed, especially for early stage and growth stage companies. Like you have to move, you need action all the time, but you need those decisions to be really good. So how do you constantly have, how are you hoovering in tons of information and competing information that increases the odds that for any one of these important decisions um, that that you can make a better one? You know, that's, that's what it's about. And it's always a mixture of, to me, a mixture of judgment, quantitative data and qualitative data. Um, and they each bring something to the party. Um, the, with quantitative data, what I see a little bit too often is people putting quantitative data, big data, on a pedestal. And I've run data science teams and really phenomenal machine learning teams. And the challenge there is that there's bias in the data and there's gaps in the data. That's one. And the other challenge is that you don't really know why things are happening when you're just looking at the patterns. And so it's really easy to fall in love with a conclusion. And then it turns out that that's 
correlation rather than causation. So you need to be a real skeptic around your big data as much as you're using it and allowing that to help drive decision. Because honestly, the quantitative data is where the truth really is. People are buying or they're not buying. They're doing it or they're not doing it, right? And that's going to show up in your quantitative data. But the qualitative data allows you to go in and fill out why something is happening. Because you could ask these questions. You could observe people's behaviors. Um, so you need to round out the quantitative with the qualitative. But there's also a place for judgment because we live in and compete in really complex environments and situations. Um, the world is changing quickly. Where it's going is totally uncertain. And so you can't abdicate your own judgment to whether you're a CEO or a product manager or, or anyone else. you gotta, you got to mix the, the three. And the tactics that you might use at a particular time are going to uh, differ depending on your stage and your context. Um, but yeah, mixing up those different vectors into those big decisions, not overthinking the small decisions, but making sure you're, you're um, keeping your pace of action fast, but challenging yourself to get different inputs, I think is key. Mm -hmm. So let's put this in the context of leadership and culture for a moment, because I'm sure that you've worked with some amazing leaders uh, during your career and you are one yourself. And so this is what I observe in a lot of companies um, around data and judgment and taking quick decisions. Usually or quite often what happens is that um, people Together, they harvest the data, they look at the data, they try to analyze the data. And then there comes a moment where when judgment needs to be made and a decision needs to be um, taken and people get paralyzed very often. And the person who takes the decision um, is at least a level too high. <laughs> so basically those decisions are being delegated upwards. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a common frustration that I hear from founders and CEOs. What are they doing wrong, you think? Why do they need to be the person who's eventually taking the, the final decisions? And how can you empower and encourage your team to be making the decisions that should be made at their level? The answers to that, of course, are so context-specific. You need the right sort of cultural dynamics and empowerment happening, but you also need the right people. Uh, one of the things that I, I really learned at Neo, we were, we were running a lot of experiments with how you structure cross-functional, call it product slash innovation teams, engineering, design, marketing. Um, and uh, and we, we ran experiments as to how flat we could make the teams. And I, I learned the hard way that you always need a leader. Where the leader comes from in terms of any one of those sort of skill competencies doesn't matter as much as you just have someone who's going to um, help pull the team forward, help them make decisions um, and push things along. And so you need to, you need to have leadership at all levels, um, but then you also need to um, have set up a situation. Some people use the word safety. I find the word safety a little troublesome these days because uh, it gets misinterpreted. But you need to have a culture where mistakes are possible, where you know where failure. I'll even use that word. Failure is possible as well. Uh, when we're trying things, when we're taking risks, um, things aren't going to work out. If we've done our best, if we've done our work, uh, if we've moved with alacrity and intelligence and it doesn't work out, then okay, learn what you can, move on and try again. That shouldn't be something to be afraid of. Unfortunately, in most companies, that sort of situation isn't rewarded or, or applauded. And sometimes companies pay lip service to it, but that's still not who's getting promoted, right? The person who's getting promoted is the person who actually um, moved metrics in some way uh, in a positive way. And that's good too, uh, but you've got to be really careful about the, the lessons that you're teaching uh, all of your people. When I first got into Meetup, for example, where I was most recently the chief product officer, The teams had just come off of a huge 
uh, in some ways, my interpretation, and this may be a little unfair because I'm just coming in afterwards, but it seemed like executives uh, got excited about an idea and, and pushed it on to the rest of the company. And people didn't quite feel like they could ask hard questions about it and they executed uh, the project. It didn't work out. And then uh, a new CEO came in. There was some executive changeover. So in theory, a new culture, but everyone was still really afraid. All the projects that were being worked on were these tiny optimizations, uh, none of which were going to help the company achieve these bigger goals it was setting out for itself. So everyone was working on things that had a high likelihood of success and a low likelihood of actually achieving great impact. Um, and that was kind of the lesson that they'd been learning. And there was, there was a lot that had to be done to shake that up. Um, both directly talking to it and speaking with it, but also rethinking, being really clear about the goals and the metrics, and then creating a roadmap, uh, a high-level roadmap, not one that dictated features, but one that sort of laid out these initiatives for these big goals that we had to do, and allowing people to realize, okay, like we have to connect to these big goals. That means our results have to be bigger, but you can't get bigger results without more risk. That's that's the deal. That's the dance with the devil, right? Mm -hmm. If you want, it's, you, you see this in investment Life banking. Is on the wire. Yeah. And you see this in, in entrepreneurship. You see it in stock trading, right? If you mm -hmm. want more upside, you got to take more risk. And so, yeah, there's, I, I'm going on, but there's, and there's, there's probably ten more things I could list that needed to be done to get these teams to um, really switch where they were working. Um, yeah. but, but we did, we did get there. Thanks for sharing this example, because it's such a, um, such a, I think, common situation in organizations. I sometimes call it the scar tissue in the culture yes. of an organization. Right. And I think for a lot of, um, new CEOs or companies that are in this tran transitional period, not enough time is being spent talking about what was the past trauma and uh, what is the scar tissue that people might be carrying and really addressing it and trying to break it down and being very conscious about it. Because it's so easy to just go in and try to move things fast and completely ignore um, how people have been traumatized. But of course, when you ignore it, then it's very, very hard to um, get the results that you want to get. And you realize we're, we're talking about the same thing, it, both in terms of testing new ideas uh, and getting this kind of change. Again, you, you're saying, I need to bring change into the world. And that means you need to look at current behaviors and why they are happening with honesty. Yeah. You have to look those risks straight in the eye. You can't duck them. You can't hide from them. You have to uncover them. And it's only once you've uncovered them that you could start to tackle them. Now, how you tackle them, you're probably going to have some wins and losses, but uh, mm -hmm. but at least now you you can try. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that, of course, calls for a huge amount of empathy and listening that you mentioned at the very beginning of our conversation. Yeah. Not just listening in terms of what people tell you, but really listening with your eyes and your ears and trying to really... Um, hear the pulse of the organization and understand what's going on. It's a little bit like being an anthropologist, I think, um, that joins a new tribe and without judgment just tries to observe, you know, all the strange rituals and ways that people behave and um, acknowledge them, note them down, and then try to figure out, as you say, why are people behaving this way? Mm -hmm and um, figuring out what would be the best way, what would be the best levers um, to help people overcome some of potentially dysfunctional behaviors, like like the one that's, that you've shared. Um, this is awesome. And I want to, um, I want to talk also about this piece um, about your expectations from HR that you've written. I really liked it. And we'll put um, the link in the show notes. Um, and I think especially for people who are in the HR space or consulting space, this is going to be really interesting to have a leader like you um, sharing your thoughts around how people in the people space can uh, generate value for organizations. 
And one of your key points is around agility and how you'd like HR to be able to help organizations to be more flexible. And the word that you use that I really like is more continuous. And there's one line that, that really resonated with me. And it's, you say, it's time for people ops to stop thinking about control and instead think about building trust and accountability. So, you know, using your speaking to humans approach, let's use this. What sort of questions should HR people be asking the rest of, of the business to design a better people ops function? <laughs> I wasn't expecting <laughs> you to ask the question in that way. That's interesting. There are simple questions that whether you're in people ops or whether you're in finance, I think it's useful to go out to the, call them line managers and ask, which is simply, well, first, like, what are your goals? What, what, what are you trying to accomplish? What are your challenges in how you're trying to accomplish those? And how do those challenges um, connect to what I am doing, what my team is doing? And that could be in, around finance and budgeting, or it could be around um, people ops and all the procedures and, and policies that, I, that a company has. And see if people will open up. Um, again, you, you want to understand their context, what they are trying to accomplish so they're going to be chasing certain things. They're probably going to have OKRs or KPIs that they are chasing. Um, if you understand their goals, and then you ask the question of what's getting in your way, uh, and I would actually start fairly broad, what's the big picture things getting in your way, and then bring it down to, okay, how about, how about my particular universe? Um, what's enabling you and what actually is causing friction? If you can do it in a way that you can get people to open up and be honest, then I bet that would uncover a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you were to um, suggest some changes, and I'm particularly, you know, speaking of goals and what goals people want to achieve, I'm particularly curious about your thoughts around, is there a way to align um, the goals of the of an organization in such a way that you wouldn't get these tensions um, because the frustration that you you've described in your blog post is a frustration that a lot of business leaders share where basically just for our listeners to to have the context it feels very often that the HR is completely disconnected from the business and what the business needs and what are the daily challenges that the business faces? And I'm wondering what root causes, maybe this is the first part of my question, what are the root causes of the situation in your experience? And the second part is, is there a way to align an organization more effectively? You know, I think that, I think it's the tragedy of Best intentions and professionalism, maybe how I would phrase it. <laughs> I love that. The tragedy of best intentions and professionalism. Okay, you have to elaborate on that. <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody, everyone wants to do their job well, right? No one goes into people ops thinking, how am I going to make things more difficult for other people? Mm -hmm. um, and And so, but the question is, um, what what is your higher purpose? And and I have to have similar conversations with people in the product field as well. Um, but I think this is now I'm now I'm going to speculate here, so da dangerous territory. But I think when people get caught up in their own specific fields and silo, how do I do? call it people ops or human resources. How do I do this really well? I'm going to go to those conferences. I'm going to read those books. Uh, that's where I'm going to spend my time. Um, then I think that can, that can lead one down some rabbit holes. Um, I also think that there is a natural human tendency, even oftentimes a subconscious one, to want to be important. And I'm... 
I have this with product managers where I need to teach them how to become leaders and they need to be leaders with influence, not authority. And I need to teach them judgment so they could help make good decisions. But I also need to teach them to be, even as they're leading, to, to be leading in service of others. And, uh, and that other is both the customer and the business's top and bottom line um, and their teammates. And so the question is like, what really are the goals here? Like, is the goal an HR goal? No, that's not what we're in business for, right? We're in business to deliver value to our customers and thus revalue ourselves. That's what we're here for. And if you just get back down to basics and sort of first principles, it clears away so much of the nonsense yeah. that we have. One of my favorite things in your podcast, Aga, is you ask people their definition of culture. Mm hmm and the reason why I We're love it. We're going to get there in a second. <laughs> I know, but I, the reason why I can't resist, the reason why I love it is that you get some very common sense answers and you get some very academic answers. Mm -hmm. And I certainly know which one I tend to, um, to, to, to prefer. I mm -hmm. like saying, let's get down to basics. Let's get yeah. common sense about these things. That's what clears up the cobwebs and actually increases the odds that you can make change. But but yeah, and this is not just, um, HR doesn't just fall uh, sort of prey to these biases as well. The design community does it. The engineering community does it. The product management community does it. The marketing community does it. Um, but, you know, my, my big belief is that uh, our world has gotten competition and our world has gotten so much more complex. It takes much more synthesis. It takes more cross-functional thinking than it ever did to be able to compete effectively. And that means um, really understanding and having empathy and, and being a team for these broader things for the purpose mm -hmm. of that higher goal, not your own higher goal, the, the, the team's yeah. higher goal. Yeah, totally. And it's such an important such an important thing to keep in mind and also so difficult to make it reality yes. even in our own lives right because basically what i'm taking away from what you've said particularly it resonates for me at a really deep level is it's not about how important you are or even how big your contribution is personal contribution but how do you serve and um as you say, you know, our egos are not structured this way. No. So you, you continually get the pushback because we all have the need to be appreciated and important and have impact and influence, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a constant, I think it's a constant battle, even when you have the best intentions. So I think now I'm, I'm starting to understand <laughs> what, what you mean by saying the tragedy of best intentions and professionalism. And going back to the second point about professionalism um, in the sense of being too academic, too proper, too about doing things by the book, blah, blah, blah. I personally, you know, from, from where I sit um, in the space of culture, I think this is honestly one of the reasons that uh, the business world still doesn't want to listen to us because it's just so abstract and so out there or so academic that people just simply cannot relate and they don't see the same things when they look around. And so, you know, they will just shrug their shoulders and say, yeah, I mean, yeah, it sounds interesting, but it really doesn't have anything to, anything to do with what's going on here. So not, not going to do that. So one last question before we go to the rapid fire questions is how would you, um, you know, if the product was an idea and, uh, an idea is, or, or rather the beginning of a product is an idea. And the idea is that culture is really critical to your success. Uh, and I think we both agree that it's true. How would you, um, sell it to the business? Interesting. Is the question, just so I understand it, is the question, think of culture as a product and how do you sell that product to the business or did I misunderstand? So I think it's, yeah, it's, 
I don't know if um, I meant it to say culture is a product, but um, how can you sell the idea that we really need to be intentional about our culture because our culture is the products that we ship and um, the customer service that we deliver and basically everything that um, that comes out of this company and helps us generate revenue and survive. And so it's important that we are intentional about cultivating the right culture in our organization. Um, so maybe using an approach of, you know, building a product that people want, how would you speak about this idea to the business? Well, in some ways, I think the word culture is a tricky one and maybe even gets in the way sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the, at the end of the day, what are we trying to accomplish? Right? We, we want our customers to buy. We want them to renew. We want them to achieve great value. We want to improve our pace. Uh, we want to accomplish new things or, or, or we need to fix our business because, you know, our previous product line is stagnating and now we need to reinvent ourselves. Like these are the things that we want to do. All right. Well, we've got these assets. We've got these, these people, these capabilities, right? Um, we've got these approaches, which of which of those are going to help us with what we need to accomplish and which are going to get on our way. What do we need to change? And sometimes you need to change the people. Sometimes you need to change the attitudes. Sometimes you need to change um, the strategy or the goals. Um, sometimes all of the above. Um, but you you build up to it with from first principles again, from like just brass tacks. What are we trying to do, mm. and and what's going to get us there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It. It, it's again the same principle, right? You really need to understand what the problem is and uh, what the need is and offer a solution. And the name of the solution, I agree, sometimes doesn't really help because sometimes certain words that we use seem so intangible and so abstract. Um, that it's very hard to engage um, with, uh, with them. Exactly. Um, abstract, I think, is the exact right <laughs> word. One of the things that I've learned and... and is that you have to, you also have to try to talk in the language of whoever you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're talking to a board, you're, you're really talking in terms of spreadsheets and financials. Uh, same thing if you're talking to your CFO, which is going to be very different than if you're talking to your head of marketing or your head of mm -hmm. sales. Uh, and I think there's something there. Um, no, you're right, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Awesome. I wish we could um, go on for a little bit longer, but I know that we're almost out of time. So I want to be sure that we do the rapid fire questions. You've listened to the podcast, so you know what the drill is. Uh, five <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, and you'll, you'll try to answer them in under two minutes. And the first is your favorite question. Um, how do you define organizational culture? So I think of culture simply as the values it's the values and traits of an organization as revealed by people's actions. Mm -hmm. Love that. And what are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? So I could list a few. Are your risk takers, those people that are really kind of pushing themselves in the organization, are they fleeing to other pastors? because you have not created a home for people to take risks. Or another one is, okay, are you failing to hit your goals? And is the reason you're not hitting your goals not because the goals were wrong or too high, but because the teams can't get out of their own way? And I'll ask the third, uh, which is that if you've got a bunch of employees that are hanging out outside of work and a manager or a leader in the company suddenly joins them, does the conversation stop or suddenly change? Mm -hmm. Good ones. Love them. Okay, so let's move move on to the next one. Um, 
any um, any culture hero? So, do you admire any companies for their culture? And if yes, why? The the company that I admire from afar the most is Pixar, and I never worked there, so you know you never know what's reality versus uh, versus a projection. Mm -hmm. But a book that I have read over and over again. And I've watched the documentary on them. And I, I try to take their ideas and put it into practice mm -hmm. in my own teams you know, as best I can as, as Pixar. Um, Creativity Inc., I think, is, yeah. is an amazing book. They have managed to put out hit product after hit product um, in a way that few companies have. Yeah. I totally get why a product person would, would love that. Absolutely. And... Um, if there was just one thing that uh, you would advise people to do um, to build their own culture lab and start working on their culture and cultivate a culture that will help them and their teams to bring their vision to life, what is this one thing? It's funny, we didn't actually talk about this earlier, but what I am always looking for for myself and trying to engender in the people that report to me is a sense of partnership. Is, is that regardless of seniority, how do you create a situation, I'll even use that word culture, where people feel like real partners? And so how do you change your behavior, not, not theirs, but how do you change your behavior to allow a sense of, of true partnership to emerge? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult one and such an important one. So finally, any books um, on leadership or on culture that um, you would recommend apart well, from creativity? Yes. Yeah, so we will put it in the yeah. show notes. Yeah. <laughs> any, anything else? I have highlighted that book more than anything. You know, another favorite book of mine is Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Mm, yeah. Because, well, the topic of culture affects the entire company. Um, everything ripples down from how the CEO and the, the very, very top executive team functions. And, and those sort of these cross-functional sort of first teams uh, get mirrored all the way down in the organization. And so learning how to have a really effective first team is key. And I, I find that book very, very common sense and very effective. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, an oldie but a goodie. I love it yeah. too. Um, so finally, um, what are your closing remarks, like the final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? We covered a lot of ground here today. Uh, and so that's actually a difficult one. You know, the on the topic of scaling, perhaps, um, in some ways, when I think of growth and scaling, I, I think about cell division. It's like, you know, a, a cell has this is a little, little uh, wonky, but a, a cell has, you know, a nucleus and mitochondria and all these different pieces. And when you're, when you're a tiny startup, um, you know, five, 10 people, you've got your leader, you've got your mission, you've got your execution ability and, and the team's so small, you've got a, a sense of autonomy. And as you get bigger, you, what you're really trying to do is figure out how to allow that cell to divide and keep all those pieces together. Uh, you know, if a cell doesn't have a nucleus or mitochondria, uh, it's uh, the ribosomes, it's not going to work, right? It's going to be dysfunctional. And so as you are growing, how do you allow this replication to happen with this concept of does it have a leader? Does it have a clear mission? Does it have the right execution ability? for what you're trying to accomplish? And do you have the right level of autonomy? Which, let's be honest, the right level of autonomy can vary. Uh, it's context specific. But if you can optimize those four things, it makes growth and, and dealing with difficult situations a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I think that uh, the values that you've mentioned that you consider to be one of the key parts of culture, when you can have that DNA being replicated um, in each cell, then also it really helps things work. Yep. But I love, love, love this metaphor. Um, when I think about scaling, I often think about school of fish or flocks of birds, but have never thought about how, um, you know, cells multiply. So I'm going to steal this one. 
(laughs) (laughs) I'm warning you. Thanks for that. Um, Wow. It's been amazing. We've covered a lot of ground and I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so, so much. Um, We haven't talked about your other books, um, the science fiction books. (laughs) And uh, I'm going to put links in the show notes, but I really absolutely have to ask you, um, what made you want to engage in this and uh, write uh, science fiction? You know, I've, I've, I've always written nonfiction because I've found, whether it's blogging or the books, because I've found, like all teachers, I find that not only is it rewarding to teach others, but it also makes you understand the material so much more. And I bet you find this all the time, Aga. Uh, I had always had this question. I mean, at the end of the day, in some ways, I'm, I'm, you pick a medium uh, of creation and I, I'm dying to try it. It could be music, uh, art, uh, cooking, uh, writing, uh, software, y- you name it. And I'd always, I'd, I'd written fiction when I was young and I was curious to know, um, could I write a science fiction book? And, and I was scared of it. I'll be honest, I was scared of it. And that's a really interesting sign. Uh, and I had an opportunity earlier this year, uh, call it a, a, a mixed blessing of the pandemic, um, to have two hours really early in the morning every day um, that was fairly clear. And I decided I'm scared of this thing. That means I have to tackle it. That means I have to accomplish it. And I, when I started it, I had no idea whether I could um, write something that I actually liked and was worth putting out in the world. And I fell in love with it. And uh, not, not the book. I fell in love with writing mm-hmm. writing fiction. And uh, and so I'm going to do another one. I'm going to do multiple more. Uh, it was it was a phenomenal experience. Mm. And uh, and uh, and I I recommend I recommend it to everyone. We we're definitely going to put uh, links to your uh, science fiction books or the first one for now in in the show notes as well. I haven't read it yet, but um, I will give it a go. I'm not a huge, huge, huge uh, science fiction fan, um, but um, maybe um, it's because I haven't really read science fiction for a long, long while. So maybe I need to start uh, reading again. Um, and I totally get that, what you said about when you are terrified of something. Um, this is like your soul telling you this is going to be good. Um, two things come to my mind. One is Stephen Pressfield. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, um, War of Art, uh, for example. Mm-hmm. And he talks about that. So he says, when you have this overwhelming feeling of being terrified and absolute resistance to do something uh, before you start, it's, it's really a sign um, that uh, this is going to be transformative. And also I'm thinking about this troop of um, acrobats um, I, I can't remember the surname. It was a family. And they would uh, basically say that life is on the wire and everything else is just waiting. Mm-hmm. And, right? It, isn't, it, isn't it just amazing? Such a good, such a good thing. And yeah. So I think I, when you are writing science fiction, you, you live on the wire. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's also and this ties back to entrepreneurship, it's when you want to see something in the world and you look out there and it doesn't exist, that's mm-hmm. that's the world telling you, go do it. Mm-hmm. Totally. Thank you again. And if people want to find your blog or your books, um, there will be links in the show notes, but just as a quick thing, Twitter, LinkedIn, where should they try and connect with you? So my, uh, I've, tried to split my universes, my um, business blog, talking about tech and entrepreneurship and product. That's all at gifconstable.com, uh, gif with two Fs. And the sci-fi website is gwconstable.com. And uh, uh, my Twitter handle is gifco. Feel free to connect with me on there, G-I-F-F-C-O. And um, for science fiction, it's GW Constable. Good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Olga, this is a pleasure. Thank you. I'm Aga Bayer, the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. 
Production Manager, Lindsay Nunez. Art Director, Emily Spencer. Aaron Scott, Content Editor. Sound Producer, James Ead, Be Heard. If you haven't subscribed to The Culture Lab yet, you can do it on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and many other places where podcasts are available. If you'd like to subscribe to my newsletter, The Culture Lab Insider, go to www.agabayer.com slash podcasts and scroll down to the very bottom of the page. That's www.agabajer.com slash podcasts. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to it. So, before I give you a sneak peek into the next episode, here is a quick reminder. This episode is brought to you by the Culture Strategy Bootcamp, a virtual bootcamp that helps you create a thriving culture at scale. So, if you are a leader in a company that grows, and if you want to start turning your strategy and your culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth, definitely check it out. Applications for this edition of the Bootcamp are now closed, but you can subscribe for updates about the full edition. Just type this into your browser. bit.ly forward slash culture dash bootcamp. That's bit.ly forward slash culture dash bootcamp. And now a quick preview of the next episode. So my next guest is Karen Reed, the author of a new book, Suddenly Virtual. Karen has been teaching business professionals how to be effective on camera for nearly a decade, and she's leveraged her experience as an Amy Award-winning broadcast journalist to do so. In our interview, we talk about the challenges that come with this sudden transition to remote, remote work that we've all had to go through, and we talk about how to overcome these challenges. So in this snippet, Karen talks about the benefits of having your camera switched on during your virtual meetings. A camera holds you accountable. You know, it, it, it can see if you are multitasking. Yes, we know that you are texting or yes, we know that you're checking email or online shopping. We can tell that you are not connected with, with uh, what is going on at that time. Uh, but also it's a matter of keeping you focused. Um, people pay much better attention whenever they can actually see your face as opposed to you just uh, presenting as a disembodied voice. Uh, so it, it's important for you um, as a way of having almost an accountability partner in the form of, you know, seeing um, yourself on the screen, but it also uh, gives uh, you pause whenever you think, oh, well, maybe I'll just kind of do this while it's going on, you know, and, and you're, and you're not really fully engrossing yourself in the task at hand. I mean, so much research has been done about multitasking that it doesn't work, uh, even though we all want to try. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lamp. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared.